let's get started with book three, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. This is your online lecture and peppered through the lecture you're going to find five different challenges and I hope that you'll see a challenge that you're interested in completing and sharing with us in order to win that prize I talked about in the introduction. Before we get to book three though, let's review. Let's talk about what we covered in our first two meetings. When we met for the first time and we discussed Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, we focused on characters in the story. Do you remember what we said about characters? How you analyze characters? Well, we took that word pairs and we broke it down into five separate aspects. Do you remember what P-A-I-R-S stands for? In case you don't, I'm going to remind you. P stands for physical appearance. A stands for actions and attitudes. I stands for inner thoughts. R stands for reactions. And S stands for speech. And we talked about how all of these things that characters do and say and think and feel and look like tell us more about what kind of person they are and how they fit into the story. So here are three new characters in Azkaban. Do you recognize them? On the left we have Sirius Black. He's going to be very important to our story. In the middle there's a Dementor. We meet that Dementor on that train ride over on the Hogwarts Express. And the other person we meet on that train ride is pictured here on the right. That's Remus Lupin, right? He's the next in the long line of Defense Against the Dark Arts professors. So I bet that any of you out there could definitely write an amazing character analysis of any of the characters in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, couldn't you? Because you know how. You know how to look at all those aspects, physical appearance, actions and attitudes, inner thoughts, reactions, and speech, and explain how those things build the character and make them fit into the story in a certain way. Hmm, that kind of sounds a little bit like um, a challenge. So we're at our first challenge, you guys. Challenge number one, should you choose to accept it, is to write a pairs analysis of any of the characters in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Be sure to include details about the characters and explain how or why those details are important to understanding them and to creating a good story. Okay, in our second meeting, what did we focus on? We focused on setting, or the place and the time that the story occurs. We also mentioned that setting can create a mood in a story. And here pictured are three new settings in our third book. On the left, you can see the night bus, right, where Harry spent a little bit of time near the beginning of the book. In the middle of the screen, you can see um, a cell inside Azkaban prison. We learn a lot more about that place in this book. And on the right, you can see our three main characters in the shrieking shack near the end of the book. So. How do you think each of these locations helps set the mood for this book? And for that matter, what is the mood of this book? What is the feeling of this book? Hmm, that sounds like another challenge. Challenge number two, should you choose to accept it, is to write about how one setting in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban helps create a specific mood in the book. So describe the setting with many details and explain how the details are important in creating a feeling in the book. Plot. 
So in our lecture today, we're going to focus on the plot of a story. The plot of a story is its main events and the order in which they appear. The order, yes, the order. You see, sometimes books tell events out of order, even though it doesn't really seem like it's going out of order. Okay, for example, think back to Harry Potter book one. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Does Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone start out with Harry being born? No, it doesn't. It starts on Harry's 10th birthday, right? Like in this picture on Privet Drive, we see Dumbledore dimming all the street lights. And then later on in the story, we kind of flash back to events from the past. And sometimes those events are told by other characters in the story. And then we learn the real order of how and when things happen. So there is something that's very tricky about plot in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Something that makes plot and something that makes the order of events extremely important. Can you think of what that is? The strange, interesting, or unusual thing about the event, order, and time in this book. It is time travel. So in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, we have an added element of time travel that makes the plot a little bit trickier. Okay, before we know all about plots, we have to talk about the individual parts of plot. So I'm going to explain some terms to you in the next few screens. So one technique that you can use to study the plot of a story is to make a plot diagram, which is kind of like a map of the story. Here is a drawing of what a plot diagram can include, and we're going to look at each of the individual items later in just a minute, but you can see that the drawing is shaped kind of like a mountain. At the top of the mountain, the story is the most exciting, and then things get less exciting as you move down the mountain. So we're gonna come back to the drawing again once we've covered all of the individual terms on it. So let's just start down here at the bottom of the mountain where everything's flat before we get going. Okay, so a warning here. Some of the words we're going to learn today are a little bit fancy, but don't let that bother you. Um, the first term I'm going to teach you is exposition. Say that with me now, exposition. Exposition is really just all of the explaining about the background and the circumstances that you have to get out of the way near the beginning of the book in order to understand why everyone is doing what they're doing. And all of our Harry Potter books so far have kind of started out on Privet Drive with a lot of description about what people look like and what they do and how they act. So it, it's not the most exciting part of the story in learning about Harry's bedroom under the cupboard of the stairs, but um, it's important because it, it uh, is a foundation for what is the going to happen that's more exciting later on. So this is the exposition of the story before we start climbing our mountain. Okay, here's our next term. Our next term, I'm sure you know this term, is conflict. And conflict is really just the problems inside the story or the things that make the story interesting. And our plot does need to have a conflict. We have to have somewhere to go. We have to have a problem to solve. And really good books like Harry Potter usually have a lot of different conflicts. I bet we could name at least 20 different conflicts. But maybe the first one that comes to mind is Harry versus the Dursleys, right? That might be the first conflict we all hear about in Harry Potter. Let's talk a little bit more about what conflict is. It's important to know that we can have many different kinds of conflict. 
you know, sometimes we talked about how we have different kinds of characters, like major characters and minor characters. Um, but we can have different kinds of conflict, too. Conflicts can be easy to see and sometimes a little bit harder to figure out as well. Conflicts can get uh, resolved quickly or some conflicts take the whole book to resolve. Conflicts can also be external and internal. Let's take a closer look at the difference between external and internal conflict. So an external conflict is a clash between two forces or two people or two things that's happening inside the action of the story. So say we have in Harry Potter a Quidditch match between uh, Gryffindor House and the Slytherin House. And that's an external conflict, right? That's a battle between two teams to see who's going to score the most points. Okay, now less obvious but still important conflicts can be internal or happening on the inside of the character's heads. And sometimes we learn about it through listening to their thoughts or seeing their actions. So for example, during that Quidditch match, maybe Harry is doubting his ability to perform well or to be able to catch the uh, snitch. And that is an example of an internal conflict in the story. So do you see how conflict works? It's important because it makes the story possible. We need these problems to solve to make our plot go forward, to move our story up the mountain. That make, takes us to our next term, our rising action in the story. So that's when things get complicated or suspenseful. This is the climbing up part of the mountain from our diagram. And suspense is that sense of excitement that we have or, or that sense of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen, but we really want to find out. And that's what's going to keep us climbing that mountain and getting to the top of our story, our mountain. So climax, this is the mountain peak, the top the most exciting part of the story when the suspense and excitement is at its greatest. So in book one, we might say that the climax of the story is when Quirrell reveals himself as Voldemort to Harry. And in book two, we might say the climax is when Tom Riddle reveals himself as Voldemort to Harry. Hmm, I see a pattern here. But everything that happens after the climax is downhill as far as excitement and suspense goes. And that brings us to the falling action. This is the part of the diagram that we go down the mountain. Things get less exciting. And we understand how and why everything's been happening. Light bulbs begin to go off for us. So the things that happen now don't make the uh, story more exciting, but they start to explain what happened. And that gets us to the last part of our plot diagram. Finally, we have the denouement, and that is a very fancy French word. I know, it really kind of means just our resolution. And that's when our conflict conflict gets resolved. We get a good explanation of why and how everything strange or unusual was happening. And our, our questions are answered. We finally understand. Um, sometimes in Harry Potter books, this is that chat that the main characters have with the other characters and they sort of go over what happened when everybody else wasn't around. And they explain, you know, how they were able to overcome those final challenges. Okay, so now let's look at an example of a plot diagram for a very famous story that I'm sure we all know. Here is how Goldilocks and the Three Bears might look in a plot diagram. So you see down here on the left where things are flat, the exposition is set up, right? We meet the Three Bears and we get a good explanation of why they have to go out in the woods and leave their breakfast on the table. 
We get the setup. We get our once upon a time. And then we get the conflict, the problem in the story, when the bears have left and Goldilocks comes upon um, an empty house and she begins to explore. The rising action occurs when she begins to do things that complicate things, like she starts breaking the chairs and tasting the porridge and um, messing up the beds, right? The climax is that point where the bears return and, oh my goodness, there's a sleeping girl in this bed. What is going to happen? That's the climax. And then we get our falling action, right? Goldilocks runs away. And then the denouement or the resolution is when she returns to her own home and we get our happily ever after. See, easy. We just plot diagrammed that whole story. And I'll bet you could use your new knowledge to draw your own plot diagram for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Hmm. Sounds like a good challenge. So challenge number three, should you choose to accept it, is to illustrate your own plot diagram of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So I know the other challenges have been heavy on the writing, but if you like to draw, maybe this is the challenge for you. You can use that Goldilocks plot diagram that we just looked at as an example to work off of, but is challenge three your challenge? Well, I want to teach you one more term before we go that's not on the diagram, and that term is foreshadowing. And foreshadowing is when the writer of the story drops little clues about an important thing that will happen in the story, but without giving it all away. So two separate elements of the book that come to my mind when I think about foreshadowing are, one, the time travel plot element. There are definitely clues about time travel in this book. Can you think of some? Hmm. And two, the fact that Remus Lupin turns out to be <gasps> a werewolf. Really, there are lots of clues on that one as well. What could they be? Hmm, I'll bet you could write a whole essay on that. Hmm, seriously, that sounds like a challenge. Challenge four, should you choose to accept it, is another writing challenge. So I'd like you to write about how either Hermione's time travel or Lupin's identity as a werewolf is foreshadowed in the book. Remember to include specific details and explain why they are important in creating suspense. Another writing challenge. Are you up for it? Okay, so if you're not into writing and you're not into drawing, if you'd like to make something, if you'd like to make a craft, uh, listen up. I wanted to show you some photographs and give you some step-by-step -step instructions if you wanted to make your own Quidditch pitch that I showed you in the video intro. Um, this is the picture of the Quidditch pitch I made with my children. We're big Harry Potter fans and we spent the afternoon creating this. And it looks a little complicated, but it was actually pretty easy and a whole lot of fun. So let me take you through it step by step. The first thing we did was just gather everything together. Um, we needed a shoebox, some paper, some glue, some scissors, and other art supplies. Anything that you can color with or draw with, you will probably need that to make your Quidditch pitch. But it's important to kind of decide on a plan first, like what part of the box you're going to use for what part of the, the Quidditch field. So we decided that we'd go with sort of a green bottom and we'd cut the top of the, the box, the lid, we'd make it a little bit more rounded to try to, uh, so you could see closer into the box maybe a little bit. So we cut it up a little bit. Um, that's step two. Cut the box into the shape that you'd like and you may need to use some tape maybe to prop the lid up or to move things over to the side 
Um, but a little bit of tape and a little bit of scissors can do wonders. So the next step was that we decided to cover up the shoe box so you couldn't see the brown and the, all the words on the box anymore. We just thought it would be easiest to use colored paper and to tape it onto the box in the spot that we wanted that color. But you could also use paint if you have that or you could use white paper that you draw on. You know, however, uh, w whatever works for your plan, do that. And then once we had our box all covered up, we drew individual elements and then we cut them out and we pasted them onto the box in the place that we wanted them to go. So we drew four different spectator towers, one for each house. We drew a crowd in the background. Um, we drew lines on the Quidditch field and then we cut those all out and we put them exactly where we wanted them on the page. Then we added our accessories. Um, we used pipe cleaners to make the goal hoops. You may have seen that in the photo. We also made some broomsticks out of little pencils and then paper and rubber bands. We just cut little strips of paper up and then wrapped them around the pencils and, and stuck them on there with a rubber band. Um, but you can be as creative as you'd like, add whatever you want until your Quidditch field looks exactly like you like it. And then, you know, just imagine and play and share the fun with everyone. Um, we decided at the last minute that we needed a Dementor flying overhead in our Quidditch match here. And we needed a scoreboard. So we added those sort of after we had already started playing. You can add at any time. So that brings us, of course, to challenge number five. If you'd like to make something, make a model of a Quidditch field using a shoebox paper and anything else that you have at home. Be creative and have fun. Of course, I cannot wait to see your amazing work. I want you to share it with us. Please submit photos of any of the challenges that you complete to us by email, library at cityofkeller.com. If you complete more than one challenge, send pictures of both because we'll put your name in our drawing for every single challenge that you complete. You need to get them to us by May 31st this year to be entered into our drawing for the Harry Potter Perler Bead craft pack that I showed you in the video intro. So if you want to win, get busy, you guys. I want to see your great work. And of course, I want you to keep reading. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is book number four. It's my personal favorite. And we're going to discuss it in June. I don't know what that discussion and what that meeting is going to look like for us, but stay tuned to our webpage, all of our social media outlets for more exciting information about how we'll meet to discuss Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. See you soon. Keep reading.